Imagine it's early March, and I've invited you to join me on a tour to Disneyland, specifically Tomorrowland. Now, we could fly to Shanghai or Paris or Anaheim or Orlando, Hong Kong, Tokyo. What would we see there? We'd see nobody walking around. We'd see offices that are empty. We'd see no cars in the street. We'd hear no planes in the sky. We'd see people, yes, but they'd have this force field between them, six feet, eight feet, 10 feet, whatever it is. Delivery vans would be all over the place. The people would all be wearing masks, somewhat hard to hear from time to time. Very few people would actually go to work. Apparently, most of them, if they can, work out of where they live. Now, just imagine that. What a strange world. But as metaphorical as that trip to Tomorrowland might seem, I think that's closer to the reality that we're all entering. It is, in fact, tomorrow. Now, I don't know you. I don't know any of you. I don't know what jobs you have, what organizations you're in, what businesses you're in. But I'm going to presume that if you're watching this, you're a decision maker and a leader and a manager and executive of some sort. And as such, understanding the tomorrow that we're entering is probably going to be pretty important to your success in leading the team, in channeling the organization in the direction that you think it needs to go to deal with this new reality. Now, Tomorrowland is interesting, metaphorically, of course, but what makes this particularly acute is the nature of this situation we are in the middle of and hopefully coming out of. It's more than just a pandemic, obviously. Pandemic sometimes people think of as a natural disaster. It happens, we recover from it. But this is much more than that. This is triggering an ongoing economic collapse or downturn. On top of that rolling, recurring pandemic itself, and that calls for something, I think, in this particular circumstance that goes beyond what many people are talking about, which is the challenge of recovery, but opens up, ironically, an opportunity for what I would characterize not as recovery, but as discovery. Because this situation is so different. It has totally changed the landscape that most of us are familiar with. Think of it for a moment. The business models we were confident in, the products, the services, the way we organized our organizations, the way we manage people, the way we collaborate on teams, the way we interact with customers, with investors, with the public, much of that has dramatically changed. And in that change comes the opportunity to detect new patterns, to pick up new ways of operating, new models of doing business. You know, I've sometimes thought as I deal with these kinds of issues that, that all of us are in the from to business. Think of it for a second. We're all trying to move an organization in one direction or another. We're trying to grow the organization. We're trying to grow the organization, but we also know that growth means more than just more, certainly more of the same. It requires innovation. It requires employee engagement. And those are things that are aspirations. Those are things that we want for our organizations that we don't yet have enough of. And in that sense, we all are in that from to business. We know what we're leaving, but we may not be so clear on what we're moving to. I'm lucky enough to also be in that from to business. I teach at UC Berkeley Haas School of Business, Princeton, uh, and executives with executive education programs around the world. I get a chance to advise businesses, government agencies, nonprofit organizations on various strategic issues. And I get a chance to write and share ideas with the broader public. This from to environment is, I think, interesting to think of in one other context. Because regardless of the organization you're in, or the role that you play in that organization, or the industry that you're in, I would suggest that the single biggest challenge that most of us in the from to business face is the status quo. And this situation has forced all of us to confront the status quo we were so familiar with and in some cases comfortable with. 
As I've thought more about this, I was intrigued by the phrase shelter in place. Because six months ago, 12 months ago, I would have characterized many organizations as, in effect, sheltering in place, stuck in their own version of the status quo, resisting change, resisting transformation, resisting re-engineering and redesign of their business processes, their relationships with their customers, the experiences that their employees have. But this corona situation has forced all of us out of that comfort zone. And the opportunity for a leader and an executive focused on where we need to go, where your organization needs to go, is to identify where this new Tomorrowland might be and what it might entail. And that's why I call this a discovery opportunity more than a recovery challenge. Now, I think there's probably one thing that discovery depends upon initially, and that's humility. Because face it, most of us, most businesses, small businesses, unicorn ventures, nonprofits, government agencies, universities, consulting firms, most of us got this wrong this time around. We're all scrambling to try to figure out what to do next and where to go. Humility is a good place to start a voyage of discovery. But the humility by itself needs to yield to a second dimension of this discovery voyage, and that's curiosity. Curiosity that accepts the fact that you don't know what the answers are yet. You don't know what kind of organizational structure is going to work in this new reality. You don't know how people are going to collaborate, how customers are going to express their expectations or dissatisfaction with what you're bringing to them, what impatience investors are going to have about your organization, how you're in fact going to make decisions, how you're going to conduct meetings. We don't know yet. And that's where curiosity kicks in. Curiosity is an odd resource to tap into. I suspect most of you have had some experience in dealing with strategic planning exercises in one form or another. And you probably know the drill, right? You organize a team around the organization of talented people. Sometimes you'll hire an outside group of consultants. You'll give them some time. You ask them to anticipate the future, understand strengths and weaknesses of the organization, and plot some kind of compelling or convincing, hopefully clear path to the future that your company aspires to. I've seen a lot of those activities over my career, and unfortunately, many of them fall into a trap of extrapolating from what's familiar in the guise of thinking about what's not, the future. So much so that I was scratching my head and I said, there must be a name for this. And I looked around, I couldn't find a name, so I came up with one on my own. I call that exercise Molbau, M-O-L-B-A-U. It's not a town in Austria or Germany. It stands for more or less business as usual. And I think that's the trap that many organizations find themselves in, even in the best of times, and sometimes retreat to in the worst of times. As I've thought about that some more, I decided to add what I think is an academic amendment to that acronym that captures the essence of the opportunity and challenge that most of us face today. My new acronym, T-A-B-A-U, TABO. What's it stand for? This ain't business as usual. Because I think that's the frame that encourages people to ask questions, to apply that resource of curiosity that every organization, and indeed every person in organizations, have available. I've seen too many organizations get stuck in that earlier zone. And that's not going to cut it, I think, going forward. So real growth, as I've said, depends on innovation. Innovation depends on experimentation. And experimentation always requires you not only to be willing to ask questions, but also a willingness to accommodate yourself and adapt to the inevitable companion of, in of innovation. And that's failure. 
In other words, the three things that your organization wants the most, growth, innovation, and employee engagement, ironically, but intimately, depend on the one thing you probably want the least, and that is failure. One of the two books I wrote is called The Other F Word. I wrote it with a colleague from Haas, Mark Coopersmith. It's an Amazon bestseller. The Other F Word, How Smart Leaders, Teams, and Entrepreneurs Put Failure to Work. You might find it useful as you think about embarking on your version of this voyage of discovery. But you know, entrepreneurs are great at creating, finding, discovering value beyond the resources they control. It's what's made the San Francisco Bay Area such a global hotspot for so many years. The sweep of what entrepreneurs have been able to do to detect new patterns in businesses, to be able to apply new technologies. They've been able to grow and build businesses, in some cases, not from scratch exactly, but from very few resources. They spot things that the rest of us may miss. And in all of the work that I've done, both building businesses, helping others build businesses, advise large companies on how to become more entrepreneurial and more innovative, I've been intrigued by an analogy that may not seem obvious on its face. And that is the analogy between entrepreneurship and farming. Think about what farmers do, right? They grow things from practically nothing. Seeds, dirt, water, fertilizer. It's amazing. But you know, farmers have a secret ingredient that makes them successful many times. Photosynthesis. It's a magical, nat natural process. And as I was thinking about this analogy, it occurred to me that what entrepreneurs do and what successful entrepreneurial organizations, even large ones do, is their own version of this. And I've admittedly borrowed and to some extent bastardized a term from science to capture this notion. And I call it protosynthesis, the rapid conversion of an idea into a testable prototype. And I think that that process of protosynthesis is going to be one of the key things for you to focus on as you bring your organization out of this corona crisis and into a discovery opportunity that lies ahead in the transformed landscape that we are all dealing with. Protosynthesis. How quickly can your organization convert the ideas of your people into prototypes for testing, prototypes of how to run meetings, prototypes to how to organize teams, how to bring new product concepts to market, how to change business models, how to develop new relationships with your suppliers, how to change in some ways even something as fundamental as your culture. Because your culture is, as you know, probably your greatest single asset. The vision that you bring, the integrity with which you embrace that vision and pursue it is critical. How can you convert the eye of isolation and social distancing into a new version of the we that you're going to depend upon to define the culture of tomorrow. And that brings me to the last dimension of what I would characterize as a discovery agenda. And that's audacity. Because as most of you have experienced, everybody wants to be number one. But very few people want to go first. This is going to be an opportunity, a frontier open field, in which going first is going to pay off. Going first in answering and asking some of those questions about how are you going to manage and convert the resources that you do have available into value for your employees, for your customers, for your investors, for yourselves. Think about it. There are opportunities here. These Zoom meetings that we're having, guess what? There's some unusual advantages of this. Introverts, who in most business environments get run over in what I call kind of the tyranny of the extroverts. But this format can finally make it available for introverts to share their ideas, 
to share their analysis, for the rest of us to shut up and listen a bit more. Meetings might end up being more productive even. Meetings are the black hole of most organizations, right? It's where productivity goes to die. But these Zoom video meetings and their counterparts can actually potentially improve our opportunity to get value out of the meetings that we have and the interactions that we enjoy. Think about business models. Think about how your organization may finally have had to confront the reality of the rhetoric you've probably been talking about. We need digital transformation. Well, guess what? The coronavirus has digitally transformed most of us in terms of how we operate. How is your organization going to redefine itself where the market is using digital in the way that old markets maybe used electricity? It is that fundamental to virtually everything that you do, how you operate, how you make decisions, how you collaborate, how you finance, how you deal with your customers and other stakeholders. Think about new ways in which you're going to share information while preserving security in a much more fluid and flexible working environment than most of us anticipated as recently as two to three or six months ago. Think about how your organization might be able to create new rituals, the electronic version of campfires that rebuild and create a culture that's redefined and animated by the possibilities of this new reality. Think about new patterns. Think about the opportunities and challenges and changes in your market, in your environment, in the ways that entrepreneurs do. Where are the new opportunities for value? Where are the new relationships? Where are the new ways of operating leading that may open up new markets for the future. I've used the term reality a lot in this brief chat with you. I say it's a chat, but it's really one way. Sorry about that. I'd be happy to talk with any of you independently, by the way, but um, I've used the term reality a lot. I think what we've really entered here is an e-ality, an electronic version of reality. And it's going to transform most of how we think about things and how we do things, how we operate. And I think there are certainly challenges in the middle of that, frustrations, disappointments. But I also think there are significant opportunities available to create new forms of value, to, in effect, build your own version of Tomorrowland that is not dystopian. It's not utopian either. It's just different than what we've been accustomed to. It's what you discover when you go on a voyage of discovery. New patterns, new cultures, new language, new ways of operating, new ways of thinking. And when it comes to innovation, think about how your organization might depend less on disruptive innovation, but may create a culture in which with this new reality that we are dealing with, you could foster the kind of eruptive innovation in which every single person in your organization feels like her or his ideas can contribute to this new uncharted future, this new tomorrow that your organization is looking for. That is a tomorrow land worth visiting, and it's one that is within your ability to help create. Thanks a lot. Look forward to hearing back from you.